2020 Democratic field is a vast one. It includes a wide variety of candidates, some of whom are more palatable than others. However, whether you want an independent socialist, a billionaire donor, a governor with an expertise in the environment, a spiritual advisor, a former HUD secretary, there are all kinds of options out there for you. It's a shopper's paradise and an indecisive person's nightmare. One thing that you might not have expected to find on the shelves of the 2020 Democratic field, however, is a consultant who decided that he should run for president. Someone who was destined to become a Robbie Mook or Karl Rove-like figure, a cringe-worthy, awful, uncharismatic, immoral sack of shit, who then wants to go out and make himself into a hero. Well, we got one of those. The field was big enough that we pulled one of those guys in. His name is Pete Buttigieg, and he currently holds what CNN terms a strong fourth in the race for the Democratic nomination. So, let's take a look at Pete Buttigieg 2020. He is, without a doubt, the corporate media's favorite neoliberal. In this video, I will expose the fact that he is possibly the most corrupt candidate in the entire field. He lacks any form of morality whatsoever. He's a dilettante. He has no courage whatsoever, and he also lacks any semblance of leadership skills or the ability to govern. So, let's get into it. Based on the extraordinary sense of entitlement that Pete Buttigieg displays anytime anyone dares to question him on anything, you might think that he must be a trust fund baby, but in reality, he is simply a middle class child. That being said, he still had other privileges like having parents who both have PhDs. That gives him a massive leg up on all of his potential competitors and contemporaries. I've known people who have one or two parents who either have a PhD or a law degree or a medical degree, and if you have a parent who has achieved that, then your chances of failure are effectively zero. So there is a huge cushion that's built in with that. If both your parents have that educational attainment, well, you're pretty set. There's really no excuse for not going on to have a very nice and very easy career. Pete's father is actually an immigrant from Malta. He originally wanted to be a Jesuit priest, but then he decided that he didn't want to live his life without the pleasures of the flesh, I suppose. He moved to the United States, became a professor of literature, and he began working at New Mexico State University. That is where he met Pete's mom, who is a professor of linguistics. They fell in love, got married, and then they resettled in Southern Indiana at Notre Dame, which is located in South Bend. Most likely, it would appear that Notre Dame hired Pete's mother and then his father was taken on as a spousal hire. From what I can gather, she had the more impressive career of the two of them, but I don't really know for sure, and frankly, I don't care. Buttigieg, for his part, was the beneficiary of an excellent education, as you might imagine, given that both of his parents are Notre Dame professors. They sent him to the best available private school in the area, St. Joseph High School, and he dedicated himself to his studies. He graduated as valedictorian in 2000. This, of course, St. Joseph is an elite academy, and that put him in good stead going into college. One major advantage that you get from having parents who are professors is that they know exactly how to write admission essays and how to structure a college application. Pete was therefore able to get into Harvard without any problem. He earned a BA in history and literature. So I guess he double majored. And later on, a couple years later, he won a Rhodes Scholarship to go to Oxford. While there, weirdly enough, rather than pursuing a master's or a degree higher than the one he already possessed from an Ivy League school, he instead got a second BA, this one in philosophy, politics, and economics. From what I understand, that is one major at Oxford. I might be wrong about that, but British academia is quite a bit different than American academia. So Buttigieg had a great education, but he ultimately did fall short of both of his parents. And this was my first hint that Buttigieg is at heart a dilettante, and that will be borne out by the rest of his career. 
Buttigieg has the intellect to go on to do anything he wants. He could become an expert in anything, but he doesn't have the inclination. There's no follow through with Mayor Pete. He is a surface level guy who wants to have a number of varied and mostly superficial achievements. While he was still a high school student, Pete or one of his parents wrote the winning essay for the JFK Library and Museum's Profile and Courage Essay Contest. Young Pete was able to then visit Boston. He met Carolyn Kennedy and other members of the Kennedy family. Perhaps it was this experience which got Pete really interested in going into politics. And maybe this is where his desire to become president was born. Interestingly enough, the person that Pete Buttigieg chose as the courageous individual who inspired him was none other than Bernie Sanders of Vermont, then a House representative and one of only two independents serving in that body. Bernie Sanders at that time was far more obscure than he is now, but um, he was still known to people who were very politically active. This is what makes me think that his parents recommended this because I seriously doubt that Pete was able to find out about this guy by himself. At any rate, though, Pete apparently did admire Bernie Sanders and his brand of progressivism at some point in his life, even though now it has become his mission to stop Bernie Sanders from winning the nomination. If we look at the political activity of young Mayor Pete before he got into politics in his own right, we see that he had a real knack for choosing campaigns that didn't go anywhere. Young Pete was invited to work for both Barack Obama's 2004 Senate campaign and John Kerry's 2004 presidential campaign. His expertise in all of these various campaigns would be policy research. Pete, who had just graduated from Harvard but not yet gone to Oxford, chose to work for John Kerry's presidential campaign, thinking that this was a sure fire path to victory and success. Well, we know how that turned out. He also has a long-standing political association with Indiana Democrat Jill Long Thompson, working for her in both 2002 when she ran for Congress and in 2008 when she ran for governor. In 2002, he was a mere intern, but in 2008, he was a research and policy guy. In 2006, he worked for Joe Donnelly, one of the most conservative Democrats in the country, who is now out of office, by the way. And in 2007 and 8, he worked for Barack Obama, so he finally chose a winning campaign. And it was during that time that Pete was supposedly inspired to join the military, but we'll get there when we get there. Pete Buttigieg's stated reason for joining the military is that he said that while he was campaigning for Obama, he noticed that in some communities, a whole lot of young men had gone off to war, whereas in other communities, no young men had departed for the battlefield. He thought that it was unfair that the burden of war fell on such a narrow slice of America. If he had even a hint of class consciousness, he would realize that military service falls very heavily on people who are sort of at the top of the working class or very bottom of the middle class. But Pete Buttigieg will not talk about economics or class because that is not his thing. He doesn't do that. So why did he really join the military? Very simply, he knew that one day he'd run for president and that if he served in the military, he could then run as someone who was tough and wouldn't have to argue about being tough and also that he could brag about his service, talk about his love of country, and all of that stuff. His reasons for joining, I believe, are 100 million percent political. In 2009, Pete Buttigieg determined that the most safe way to serve his country is in the Naval Reserve. So that's what he joined, and he went into Naval Intelligence. He attained the rank of Lieutenant, or O3. Just to explain to people who aren't familiar with the military organization, a lieutenant in the Navy is the equivalent of a captain in the Army, so it's the third officer rank. And also for reference, if you look at the movie Top Gun from 1986, Tom Cruise's character is a lieutenant. So um, if that helps you orient yourself, hopefully uh, now you know that he was not at the bottom of the rung, but he was still a junior officer. He served in the Naval Reserve until 2017, and for the most part, he stayed stateside and only did his duty on weekends, which is the way that that works normally. 
However, and oddly enough, rather than being deployed for, to sea when he was called up, he actually got deployed to Afghanistan. And this was while he was mayor of South Bend. So just like Tulsi Gabbard, when she's been called up to serve for short stints while she was in Congress, he also served while holding political office. He was sent to Afghanistan for seven months while serving as mayor of South Bend. Interestingly enough, he describes his duties primarily as serving as a driver for the base commander. Now, this is extraordinarily unusual. Normally, drivers are basically privates. It's very rare to have a full officer with an Ivy League degree driving a Jeep around, or a Humvee, I guess. What I think is that contrary to all the people who say that he must have been a CIA asset, Buttigieg is someone who spoke multiple languages, had a degree, etc., had political connections. There were two reasons for making him a driver and effectively a confidant of the base commander. One, Buttigieg was most likely given some sort of security clearance so he could handle classified information and he possibly served as more of a secretary who happened to be a driver. The other possibility here is that because he was a VIP as an office holder, he was simply put in a duty station where he'd be unlikely to encounter any real danger. So that seems to me to be the most likely explanation for why his duty assignments were so odd. It's also possible that because he was a Navy guy assigned to a, a land base, especially a deep inland one, that he was there because the Navy was sending in the SEALs on covert ops. So it is possible, and that, I think that fits with what I said earlier about him having a security clearance. That seems to me to be the most plausible explanation of why his duties were what they were. And as we'll see later, he also worked with McKinsey, and McKinsey often deals with sensitive subjects, and a lot of employees there no doubt have security clearances. So I think that is the most probable explanation for his time in Afghanistan, and most likely the CIA would have higher standards than letting someone like Pete Buttigieg play 007. If you've heard the scuttlebutt about Buttigieg, you've probably heard that he worked for McKinsey Consulting. Well, he did. But that is not the only consulting firm that he's worked for. And in fact, if you look at his career as a whole, right up until the point where he ran for mayor of South Bend, what we see is that Pete was positioning himself to be the ultimate political consultant. That was his calling in life. This is the thing that he's been preparing himself for his entire career. If we go back to the things that he majored in both at Harvard and then at Oxford, all of those things can be easily applied to political consulting. So now let's look at what he did between his various stints and other occupations. In the mid-2000s, Buttigieg co-founded the Democratic Renaissance Project, which is where young Democrats work to try to revitalize the Democratic Party and spread its message. From 2004 to 2005, Pete worked in D.C. for the Cohen Group, a strategic consulting group led by the former Secretary of Defense under Bill Clinton, William Cohen, and the main object of this firm is not to engage in foreign policy discussions or consulting, but rather to help corporations avoid regulations. That is to say that they hire people with political connections who know how Washington works, and they help set corporations up with tax breaks and loopholes. Since 2005, Pete has been a member of the Truman National Security Project. This is a think tank which, while ostensibly for, quote, progressives, is in reality designed to make sure that new Democrats, i.e. Democrats of the Bill Clinton and Barack Obama mold, are in line with establishment foreign policy thinking. The work of Truman National Security Project and other like-minded organizations is something that we see all the time. This is why there is very little deviation when it comes to foreign policy and why Tulsi Gabbard has been hit so hard for daring to buck the trend. It is not coincidental that all of the establishment Democrats have the same exact foreign policy. In 2007, with his new fancy Oxford degree in hand, one that, as I've argued, was superfluous, Pete was then able to get into McKinsey, one of the most prestigious consulting firms in the world. And he worked there for three years until 2010. His work there remains classified because McKinsey always ensures the um, 
safety of their clients. They always make sure to close the files and not reveal it to the public. McKenzie does have a reputation, however, for working for authoritarian governments and corrupt corporations. So whatever Pete did there was no doubt shady as all fuck. And he claims he tries to romanticize it as just being a nerd with a laptop who went around from coffee shop to coffee shop doing work and giving advice, but it's a little more nefarious than all that. So uh, either he was engaged in these projects himself, or at least he was taking pay from a company that was engaging in such things. So no matter how you slice it, it's not good. And if he wasn't entrusted with anything serious, then that's just a sign that they regarded him as a dilettante who needed to be fobbed off with light duties. So no matter how you look at it, him working for McKinsey is a massive mark against him. If he were someone who came from a more humble background, I might be a little more forgiving on this, but because he comes from a background where he and his family have always studied things like literature, things that make you engage in moral thinking, and then he's able to sleep at night knowing that he works for a company that supports authoritarian regimes and helps them market themselves on the global stage, that bothers me a lot. This is a bad misuse of education and Pete Buttigieg is an absolute disgrace to educated people across the world. In 2010, he left McKinsey and he decided to get into Indiana politics. This too, I argue, is all about his grand scheme to make himself president. By this point, he was conceiving grand ambitions and he decided to become an anti-DC guy. But as we've seen, no one is more DC than Pete Buttigieg. When he went back to Indiana, he chose a great time showing just how, what a brilliant strategist he was. He ran in 2010. This is the year, of course, where the Republicans won in a landslide, eliminating about 60 seats in the Democratic held house. Pete Buttigieg running in a red state only won 37.5% of the vote when he ran for treasurer, and it turned out to be a complete disaster. So he really has grade A instincts when it comes to when to run, what to run for, and how to position himself. Clearly, this man is electability personified. Pete Buttigieg, famously, is Mayor Pete. He is the mayor of South Bend, Indiana, a town that most people outside of South Bend, Indiana don't care about. He's been elected twice as mayor of South Bend. The highlights of his tenure as mayor are as follows. He is the youngest South Bend mayor ever. He's the youngest mayor of a city over 100,000 people, or at least he was when he was initially elected. And he came out of the closet prior to being reelected. So he was elected for the second time as an openly gay man. Those are effectively his achievements as mayor, although he's got one more small achievement we'll talk about. He won 80% in his re-election bid in a city with 10% or less voter turnout. So while 80% is impressive, I still think that his electability is far from proven since he was running in a city where most of the residents there didn't bother to turn out to vote for him or vote against him. He's still got a lot to prove in terms of electability. Also, South Bend, like most communities over 100,000 people, is fairly blue. It's, this is, of course, the home of Notre Dame University. While he was in South Bend, what did Pete accomplish? Not a hell of a lot. He oversaw some rezoning and a little bit of gentrification. So he made the rents go up on poor people. Really uh, good stuff there. He also made some sweetheart deals for some real estate developers, uh, stuff that's fairly humdrum, kind of a low-key scandal. Sort of similar to what we talked about with Eric Swalwell when I did that video. He also, at one point, tried to stand up for abortion rights. There was an abortion clinic, or there was a clinic in his town that wasn't allowing abortions, and Pete decided in a controversial move that brought in a lot of conservative Indianans from the countryside to fund an abortion clinic. He barely got that passed, and he was on the verge of winning a tough battle, which would have shown that he has a spine and principles. But then that organization extended itself just a little bit and they were able to get a zoning permit or some shit. And then Pete randomly backed out and ran away from supporting an, a local abortion clinic for the women of South Bend. If you're going to make a stand, you need to stand. 
have a set of balls. But Pete has no leadership ability whatsoever. This man has no spine. He honestly believes in his own mind that his greatest achievements are being young and gay. Those are his achievements. Not a description of him, but his achievements. Oh, in 2018, he did do something that actually is positive. He knew that going into the presidential cycle that the 2016 issue would be recycled, that being paid family leave. So he decided to make sure to do something about it as mayor, even though what he did was clearly a pittance. He got $156,000 inserted into the budget to cover paid family leave for city workers. I'm not knocking him for this. This was smart politically, and it's a good policy. But that is literally all he accomplished as mayor. He was young, he was gay, and he got a small amount of paid family leave that probably only helped a handful of people. Everyone knows Pete is young and gay. Not very many people know about his paid family leave. But what a whole lot of people know about is the police department scandal that has shaken South Bend ever since Pete came into office. In 2012, Police Chief Daryl Boykins recorded conversations of his fellow officers using racist language and discussing the performance of illegal actions. He wanted to use these recordings in order to justify firing these men. These cops then went to Buttigieg and demanded that Boykins be fired. So this is a somewhat complex issue, but you would think that someone who has a morally developed mind, a keenly honed instrument, that has been shaped by the consulting firms and the difficult challenges he had to face there, by having two Ivy League degrees and two parents that are professors, you would think that such a person could easily navigate this minefield. But Pete Buttigieg proved that he has no moral center and he has no political skills at all. He simply sided with the regular cops and fired the black chief, even though he knew that the reason they wanted him gone is because they were racist from Southern Indiana and they didn't want to work for a black dude. Now, to be fair, technically Boykins was not allowed to make these recordings because he didn't have a warrant to do so. So a more adept politician could just sell it on something as simple as I'm following procedure and then arrange for a new chief to then do a proper investigation and get rid of those officers and then later reappoint Boykins in some way and maybe even replace Boykins with another black chief since that was something that uh, also caused scandal. South Bend, just like all of Southern Indiana, has had a very troubled history when it comes to race relations and uh, people in the community have been complaining about how South Bend has a solid black community, 26% more than double the national average, but only 6% black cops. So Boykins was a symbol that the police department was trying to respond in some way to its community, and then he was summarily dismissed by Pete Buttigieg. Clearly, Buttigieg did the bidding of racist cops because Boykins was able to sue for racial discrimination and mastermind Pete had to settle for $800,000 in an out-of-court settlement. Now, South Bend is not a huge city. It only has about 100,000 people. So getting $800,000 out of a settlement if you're just a police chief is pretty damn good. And it heavily implies that the Buttigieg administration in that town didn't do such a hot job. Now, Buttigieg's response to prove that he is serious about dealing with these issues in the police department was to engage in professional class cliches, just to repeat words that don't mean anything in a soothing tone. He said that he is all in favor of eliminating police bias. So what he'll do is mandate that people do training. Well, I'm here to tell you that kind of stuff doesn't work. This is something that people engage in in both academia, the corporate world, and of course the consulting world where they make people take little online quizzes and they have goofy ass videos and it's supposed to change people's hearts and minds. But all it does is just annoy people and give them useless information. So yeah, this is not going to work. This is a not a serious solution. This is just making noise when you have to feel a silence. That's all he's accomplished. Later on, to also prove his seriousness, Pete decided to dredge up an old policy from South Bend history by bringing back a position 
of someone who would supervise the police and fire department, someone that those chiefs would report to directly and who would then report to Buttigieg. Needless to say, this is totally superfluous, and the city council shot it down. Now, if Buttigieg genuinely believed that this was the right way to go, he should have fought harder and gotten this done. But he didn't. He let it go. That shows you the kind of leadership skills that Pete has. He chose a dumb fuck initiative and then didn't show any follow through on it. Pete is a terrible leader. He's got no leadership skills. He's taken all kinds of damage from this police scandal that happened early in his first administration. He handled it ineptly. This is someone who should have been more than qualified to deal with what amounts to a very small minefield. And then he stepped on every mine along the way. This is like when Warren got the DNA test to try to get one over on Trump. This is shit political level instincts. This is, this should be disqualifying. Just because not only does he not have much resume, but the resume that he has is embarrassing. Going into the 2020 cycle, I remember looking at the field of candidates and thinking that half or more of them are simply bad impersonators of Obama. They wanted to reinvent the Obama magic, but put their own little spin on it. Pete clearly wanted to be gay Obama. That was his goal, and I believe on a certain level it remains his goal. The only thing he had going for him earlier this year when he first announced and appeared is that he was a fresh face on the national scene. So he was a blank slate. No one could really say anything bad about him. And as someone who was both millennial and openly gay, he did seem like a change candidate. He often described himself as a progressive, and as someone who was from southern Indiana and had some electoral success by becoming mayor, he could advertise himself as someone who could win in the Midwest, the area where Hillary Clinton lost the election. So, so far so good. I mean, a little obscure, a little out of the blue, but this could make for an interesting case. Maybe he actually is a legitimate local. Maybe he actually does have his finger on the pulse in the Midwest. And also his Obama impression, so far as it went, not that bad. He's got the professional class patter down to an art, and he seems very rehearsed. Now, that's not necessarily a good thing. We're in the era of keeping it real, but had Pete run 10 years ago, had he been old enough, I think he would have much better results. Um, he is very gifted at delivering canned lines. He does it better than almost anyone in the field. However, there's one vital thing that Pete lacks. I mean, other than like um, skills or a platform, and that's charisma. All these botched Obama clones forgot that Obama wasn't just some black dude who said hope and change. Obama has a cool factor to him. He always comes off as too cool for school, but also serious, and he just strikes the right balance. Obama also came along at a point in time where we were foolish enough to think, as a society, that because he isn't white and that because he would be historical, he must be progressive and represent change. Then we had Obama, and now we get to the imitators, and people aren't going to be fooled again, as the Who song tells us. So, yeah, Pete forgot to add the crucial ingredient of charisma, and that is why he has not proven to be a second Obama. As for Pete Buttigieg's platform, it is pretty laughable considering that this guy is so proud of how smart he is. He talks about all the languages he knows. He never fails to mention that he's a Rhodes Scholar, that he was a consultant, that he served in the military. So he's had all of these experiences, and yet his platform is vapid. It's literally not much different than Beto O'Rourke, who is basically openly dumb. He has a vague, unsettled Supreme Court packing scheme. I agree with him that the Supreme Court is broken and that it needs to be reformed in some way. Buttigieg offers like two or three ways to go about it and he won't stick with one. It seems like he only did preliminary research despite being a research expert according to how he uh, worked on various campaigns in the past, but he can't settle on what he wants to do. That comes across as weak and also superficial. He's clearly not that concerned about the Supreme Court because he doesn't know where he wants to go in terms of fixing it. He wants to abolish the Electoral College. That's a great idea. Um, he is one of the stronger voices on that, all credit to him. And I think that he also has helped to popularize that idea to some extent, so that is a positive outcome of his campaign. 
He has a very vague, unspecific economic agenda to help workers. He occasionally talks about unions. That's all good. Um, it's better than most of his competitors, to be quite honest. But it's not good enough. You need to have something specific. Um, I think he's talked a little bit about wages, but you need to talk more about how you want to create jobs, how you want to alleviate economic suffering, how you want to help people pay their bills, ensure their livelihoods, ensure this, a social safety net. He, his lack of detail shows me where his priorities are, and his priorities are clearly not with the working families of America. He talks about focusing on rural investment and broadband services. I imagine that has a lot to do with why he has had some success in Iowa thus far. Rural investment is important. Rural America is often overlooked. However, in a Democratic primary, most of your vote is more urban. And I'm not saying by any means that people who live in rural areas should be neglected. But what I am saying is that this is not a path to victory in the primary. If we look at the general election, this might help in a lot of Midwestern states, and it's not a bad idea. Um, and of course, it's good policy too. Here's the problem though. Without a specific economic agenda, his very specific parts of his rural campaign, so rural broadband, for instance, what that does is look like pandering to people who live in places like Iowa. And because he's very specific about how he will help rural people, i.e. white people, and way more vague when it comes to people of color, it reinforces the impression that a lot of people have that he's kind of racist. And the reason why most black people think he's racist is because he fired the black police chief. When you look into the details, it doesn't quite exonerate him. I mean, I think that he's not racist, he's just weak, if we're keeping it 100. Pete Buttigieg is a weak man. That's why he, why he got rid of Boykins at the earliest possible opportunity. He knew that was the quickest and most expedient way to try to end the crisis. And it ended up backfiring. He has said that the Democratic Party needs to work with organized labor, so at least Pete knows a little bit of history and has a little bit of electoral sense. Pete, however, is clearly untrustworthy on those issues. If you look at his economic agenda, it's basically non-existent. So, uh, yeah, his, his idea is just to use organized labor to turn out the vote. While that is preferable to the ideas of, say, a Hillary Clinton or someone of that ilk, it still doesn't go nearly far enough, and it does not make Pete a progressive. His foreign policy is extraordinarily status quo. Again, look at his resume. The guy's a professional consultant, and he takes his marching orders from the establishment. He is one of the more articulate messengers of the status quo foreign policy, however, so I guess that kind of works in his favor, maybe. But since he's going to be defending staying in Afghanistan, staying in Iraq, and more interventionist wars, it is not going to play well for him. And despite what a lot of the experts said, I do think he did take a little bit of damage in that last debate against Tulsi. Hopefully Tulsi will be coming back for more, although right now it looks like Julian Castro is going to try to run interference for Pete and try to challenge Tulsi himself. I guess we'll see two KOs in the next debate. One thing he advocated for that he backed off on is universal service. Now, Pete can do this because he was a super soldier who drove a Humvee. Um, the reason why he's doing this is because it sounds like something that's really important. It makes him sound serious. It makes him sound distinctive. But the problem is that Seth Moulton, who already dropped out and had no success, and John Delaney, who should have dropped out months ago, have both run on this idea, and both of them have gotten zero traction. That's why you don't know that Pete advocated for this. But if you look it up on Google, you will find out this was one of his key planks early on. Once it went over like a lead balloon, however, he dropped it like it was hot. If Pete is as terrible as I have portrayed him, and have no doubt about it, he is all that and more, then why has he been so successful in this race up to this point? Why has he managed to break away from the pack to some extent and make himself on the borderline of being a real contender? Well, it's very simple. There's media bias in the world, and that media bias very heavily likes Pete Buttigieg. In fact, if I had to put it simply, I would say that he was anointed by CNN from the moment that he announced. He was added to the Godhead. There's the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and Pete Buttigieg. 
To give you some examples of how CNN especially, but also other news networks, have fawned over Pete, at one point, this is at least a month ago, there was a poll that showed that Biden, Bernie, and Warren were all in double digits and were all doing pretty well. And then there was a huge gap and you have all the single digit candidates. At the top of the single digit candidates was Pete Buttigieg. And they described his place in the race as a strong fourth. What's strong about it? He's clearly way behind everyone else. There's nothing strong about fourth place. I think Jimmy Dore made the joke at one point that fourth place is so strong that they don't even have to give a medal for it. Okay, so that in itself is an example, a notorious and well-known example of the media bias in favor of Pete Buttigieg. He also gets a disproportionate amount of mainstream press and it's always overwhelmingly po positive. It's always in the most fawning terms. And when he does something fucked up, like when he sent out his email in South Carolina that we'll discuss in much greater detail down below, crickets. No one in the mainstream press talked about his greatest scandal, something that would have literally been disqualifying for anyone else if the media had gotten a hold of it. So why does CNN love Pete so goddamn much? Well, the fact of the matter is that there is a professional class identity politics at play in this race, and the professional class has two favorite candidates. There's Elizabeth Warren for members of the professional class who are a little more, um, I guess, progressive. She is a bit more genuine. She is a little bit more folksy. So she's kind of like someone who made it on her own, someone who has a little bit of a soul left over, has a little bit of a personality, and also seems to actually care about people. But then you have the people who are soulless, the people who just look at one's sheer professionalism, which is to say the degree to which that person has managed to kill any form of creativity, individuality, or originality about themselves and become a mindless drone. And without a doubt, Pete Buttigieg is the person who best fits that criteria. Pete is the ultimate member of the professional class. He is a stereotype of the professional class. So if you're an older, well-to-do white liberal who isn't very progressive, who thinks that socialism is a dirty word, and you just want a little bit of boomer optimism on a face that doesn't have too many deep lines and doesn't have a lot of gray hair, well, Pete is your guy. And that is the exact target audience of CNN and MSNBC. All of the viewers of cable news at this point are 65 and older for the most part. They're the only people who can and do afford cable. So why has Pete managed to do as well as he has so far? Very simple. He is beloved by the corporate media. They give him constant coverage and it's always positive. And then old rich white people watch it and they like what they see. So he has a base of well-to-do older white people, and he also has Democratic donors who love him because the guy is 100 million percent corporate. Oh, and of course, CNN, MSNBC, and other uh, news corporations are exactly that, corporations. They're owned and operated by rich people. Almost all of their anchors are millionaires. The people who own and run the stations are billionaires. Guess what? They're in favor of corporate policies. And Pete Buttigieg is a corporate dude. It all adds up. Pete Buttigieg is a custom-made candidate. And then they can pat themselves on the back and pretend that they are being moral actors and that they're being hyper-progressive and forward-looking because Pete is young and gay. It's hard to pick the most shameful aspect of Pete Buttigieg's shameful campaign. But as someone who has enjoyed the privilege of education myself, I think that there is nothing more shameful and more gross than using your privileged position as someone who has had the benefit of education to trick and lie to people who have not. And that is precisely what Pete Buttigieg has done. He has used his experience as a consultant, his extensive vocabulary, and all of the literary devices and argumentation methods that he's learned from his years of studying literature and everything else in order to try to undermine support for Medicare for All, a piece of legislation which, if implemented, would save lives here in America and also prevent people from being ruined by bankruptcy. 
Pete's stance is fundamentally immoral and insincere. The reason I know that is because he was basically for Medicare for all right up until the right up until the checks started rolling in from Pfizer and all the other health insurance companies. Pete fundamentally has no moral core and he is a brain for hire. He's been using his debate performances as center stage for sophistic performances about how Medicare for all is bad and how we need to go for his bullshit plan instead. And again, if we were to abandon Bernie's Medicare for all and implement Pete Buttigieg's, Pete Buttigieg's plan instead, what would happen is that lives would literally be lost and other people would quite literally continue to go bankrupt when they otherwise would not have to. It's hard for me to think of anything more that pisses me off more than this. This is something that has pisses me off so much. This is literally the seventh time I've tried to record this slide because I am deeply, deeply angry about this. I'd have to say that to both Pete's credit and discredit, he is by far the most effective propagandist for the health insurance companies in this campaign. Klobuchar is equally adept at bullshit, but she has as much charisma as burnt toast. John Delaney is John Delaney. But Buttigieg, like I said, he's the master of canned delivery of bullshit. He is a cliche king. He's the prince of platitudes. And recent polls show that support for Medicare for All, which had been trending really high, has been lowering, especially among independent and Republican voters. If the Democratic Party then uses this as an excuse to not go the route of Medicare for All, again, this will be largely Buttigieg's fault. And I think that he is the main reason why Warren and Yang have backed away from Medicare for All. Otherwise, if not for Buttigieg's influence, I think both of them would still be on board. As it is, they effectively ended their own campaigns by backing away from Medicare for All and gave Bernie a clear path, which I'm not complaining about, by the way. But um, it would be nice to see other candidates stand up for what is right, other than one fucking guy. Buttigieg, for all of his sophistry and all of his Ivy League training, came up with a really catchy title, Medicare for All Who Want It. They always say that uh, brevity is the soul of wit. And uh, Medicare for All Who Want It is verbose and sounds fucking stupid. The emphasis is on not forcing people to make a change and not banning private insurance. And that is pure sophistry. No one truly loves their private insurance. They would save money and get better coverage with the public system. Not only that, but the idea that Medicare for All bans private insurance. I don't think anyone has ever said that you can't buy additional supplemental coverage. I've never heard Bernie say that. Maybe it's in the bill somewhere and I'm just not aware of it. But um, one thing that frustrates me about this whole campaign is that because there's only one candidate who actually stands for Medicare for All, he can't possibly do enough counterpunching to deal with the sophistry of Buttigieg and his little followers on the stage, the other neoliberal assholes. So let's talk about how Pete Buttigieg is marketing himself. Again, this is a McKinsey consultant with two Ivy League degrees. This is someone who self-identifies as a genius and a strategic expert. This man was paid by other people to tell them how to market themselves and run a campaign. So what kind of genius level things is he doing? Well, he seems to be appealing to well-off white liberal boomers, the kinds of people who think that Clinton and Obama were great presidents. That's not a bad demographic to have, although such voters tend to be pretty damn fickle. After all, these voters turn out in great numbers, they contribute money, and some of them still go out and canvas and stuff like that. So not a bad base. The problem is he doesn't appeal to anyone else. And a large part of that, aside from his terrible record and non-existent platform, is that Pete Buttigieg's frame of cultural reference is basically that of someone twice his age. Buttigieg comes off as incredibly corny, out of touch, and dishonest, to everyone who's not a sort of middle of the road boomer Democrat. To give you a hint of how he doesn't really understand that policy is the new cool, Pete Buttigieg's official campaign t-shirt, the one that's primarily displayed on his website, says boot edge edge. 
That is a phonetic explanation of how to pronounce his name. So you know that it's going to be a great campaign when your slogan effectively is, here's how you say my name correctly. But that's also contradicted by the fact that he doesn't insist on being called Buttigieg. He also just lets people call him Mayor Pete or Pete. So it comes off as a little bit bipolar. Do you want people to pronounce your name correctly, or do you not give a fuck and just worry about them remembering you at all? They could call you the mayor guy. The guy looks like a chipmunk. I mean, it doesn't matter as long as they remember you. But Pete hasn't stuck with anything. He's been flaky. He can't decide on a course of action. The strategist has no strategy. And then there's the high, high hope stance. First of all, I feel bad for Fallout Boy, and I think they should seriously write a letter or send out a tweet denouncing Buttigieg using their song, because otherwise he is forever destroying any credibility that they had with the target demographic for their music. Um, this kills the cool factor for Fallout Boy forever. This dance is a national embarrassment. I can't put it any other way. This is the most cringy thing that I have seen a political campaign do pretty much ever. Hillary Clinton's campaign made me cringe nonstop. Pokemon go to the polls. But even Hillary Clinton had more dignity than this. This is fucking terrible. Um, honestly, when I saw this dance for the first time, I wondered if this was someone making fun of Pete Buttigieg. I wondered if this was some sort of way to undermine him. But no, this is something that he came up with, something that he believes in, that he instructs his minions to go teach people. Um, unbelievable. Mind-blowing. And, uh, yeah, I don't know what else I can say about the dance. It hasn't already been said before, but when, when I see it, what comes to mind for me is if, if I were running for president and one of my campaign advisors came up with that dance and then showed it to me, what I would do is what Joker did in the 1990 Batman. Or was it 89? Either way, since Burton Batman. I would ask that person to hand me his gun. I would take it. I'd shoot him right on the spot. Not even kidding. Well, I guess in real life, of course, I'd just fire the person. I wouldn't actually shoot them. But you know what I mean. I would not react well to that. And the fact that Pete saw that shit and he's like, yeah, that's pretty cool. Fallout Boy is cool. The kids are going to flock to my campaign. This speaks to his electability in a very negative way. And while this seems like a small thing, this should in itself be completely disqualifying. So, his appeal boils down to a kind of dorky professional class identity politics, i.e. using identity politics on people who should be smart enough and wise enough to theoretically not engage in such bullshit and focus on policy instead. But the fact is, as someone who has uh, been in grad school for a long time and knows a lot of people with higher education, a lot of times having a high IQ or having a well-developed educational background does not mean that you have any sense at all when it comes to politics. A lot of the people I know in my personal life are incredibly inept at politics. And uh, they none of them are Buttigieg fans, I think, except for one person who probably is. A lot of my friends, though, are really in the Warren because she's, quote, just like us. But anyway, this high high hopes thing. I mean, my high, high hope is that Bernie or Tulsi in the next debate will give Pete the AAA spine buster and put him out of commission in this race because I'm sick of seeing this person. I've had enough. I can't take any more Buttigieg. Every time I see him speak or see his stupid-ass dance, I just want to reach through the screen and give him a smack to wipe the smug off his face. I have to assume that as someone who is literally a professional political strategist, that Pete Buttigieg understands that the primary motivation for black voters is to vote for someone safe with name recognition who will defeat the Republicans and therefore prevent racist policies from taking place. That's how the black community has functioned for the last 40 to 50 years. Instead, however, Pete apparently doesn't understand that. Apparently, he went to the Robbie, Robbie Mook School of Political Thought and he fails and refuses to understand how voters work. When his campaign was asked why he hasn't managed to crack 1% with the black community, rather than responding with, we're going to keep working to win them over, 
Um, we are trying to reach out. We're trying to ramp up. We're trying to spread our message. We're trying to be sensitive to their needs or responding in a way that shows that he's a real candidate. He instead decided to engage in voter shaming. He said, look, black voters are homophobic. It's not my fault. I'm a great candidate. I'm running a perfect campaign. It's just they don't appreciate me because they don't like gay people. So this is the kind of butthurt bitch shit that Hillary Clinton did back in 2016 when she got angry that people just didn't understand that she's the most qualified candidate to ever walk the face of the earth. If you act like a little bitch, people are not going to vote for you. If you shame voters for not supporting you and seeing your inherent brilliance, they're not going to vote for you. And as a political strategist, someone who not only should be really good at selling bullshit, but also should understand how voters work, it's incredibly mind-boggling the degree of hubris that someone like Buttigieg has to have to pretend that he doesn't understand why black voters don't want anything to do with him. Southern Indiana is notoriously racist. It's probably more racist than almost anywhere in the entire American South, and that's saying a lot. Um, at one point, the state of Indiana had every executive officer as a Klansman, the only state to ever pull that off. Southern Indiana is not a place known for progressive racial attitudes. There was a famous interview back in 2008 where some Indiana Republican voted for Obama. A reporter was really puzzled and they asked, well, why did you switch your vote to Obama if you're a lifelong Republican? This person responded, because that N-word will get me my job back. So someone from that area was racist enough that in an interview that was being recorded by a reporter, he used the N-word. Let that sink in. And the racism of Southern Indiana is no mystery. Everyone knows about it. Um, so black voters are looking for a candidate who isn't racist and has name recognition. Pete is new, and also he's from an area that has a very suspect racial history, and he has a very spotty record himself due to that whole um, Chief Boykins incident. So those things for black voters are disqualifying to begin with. His chances of getting in on the black vote are really, really, really piss poor. So yeah, also he did some um, gentrification in South Bend, which really didn't help the black community. So there are solid reasons, if you understand politics at all, why the black community isn't feeling peaked. Also, um, if you want to get into stereotypes, black people have rhythm. They watched that high, high hopes dance and then they had high, high hopes that he wasn't going to get nominated because uh, that's some real shit right there. So anyway, this is self-defeating and it goes to show why I think Pete has no chance of winning the nomination, at least not outright. He is someone who's very thin skinned. He doesn't understand politics despite being a strategist and the guy is a complete joke. One thing you probably have heard is that Pete engaged in some dirty tricks with regard to his Douglas plan. But what you might not know is what the Douglas plan actually is. So Pete, being the sophist that he is, decided to create a plan for black people who need him to come in as their savior. And he named it after one of the most famous black leaders in history, Frederick Douglass, a contemporary of Abraham Lincoln. So. He says that his plan and his interest in racial issues is inspired by the example of Frederick Douglass. I highly doubt that Beat actually knows that much about Frederick Douglass, but whatever. This plan supposedly seeks to address systemic racism with a full understanding of America's struggles with race, something that Pete was not able to do in South Bend, but apparently will be able to do on the national stage, I guess, because it's a lot easier dealing with a large um, systemic problem than it is with a localized variation because obviously, right? This is mostly, however, just a collection of minor policies, almost none of which are actually specifically about the black community. The idea here is that this will supposedly empower communities of color through investment, the way that you empower people in a capitalist democratic society. So effectively what he's doing is taking a pot shot at someone like a Bernie Sanders by saying, I'm not a socialist, I will work within the norms of a capitalist system. What he's banking on here is that this will be read by white liberals and not black voters. So they will see that he gives lip service to the problem in true professional class fashion without actually doing anything 
So this is another example of Pete Buttigieg being the prince of platitudes. This guy has no substance, but he knows how to make things sound nice. So um, what are some of these half measures? Well, basically the point of these half measures is to prevent things from occurring like Medicare for All Universal College. So what he does is he curbs a few specific abuses. So he deals with some of the outlying symptoms that really piss people off about the healthcare system rather than dealing with healthcare as a whole. And he deals with some of the things that piss people off about how college is paid for without actually changing the system as a whole. It's tokenism, the policy edition. In terms of what he's actually doing in a positive sense, he is trying to incentivize federal workers to have workers of color, so you get more tax write-offs if you hire more people who aren't white. This is basically what I've talked about before, Suzanne Mettler's idea of the shadow government using um, tax breaks and the tax bill every year to try to influence behavior and do sort of shadow spending by allocating money in a private sort of secretive way. So Buttigieg is very much a Washington consultant. That's what's going on here. These are all minor technocratic policies that will most likely not have any kind of meaningful impact. He also wants to create student loan forgiveness for people who graduate from college, start businesses, and create jobs for people of color. So that's not a very that's not a lot of people. And oh yeah, a lot of people who start businesses, even in communities of color, are white. So while that's not a bad idea in and of itself, wouldn't it be easier just to create tuition-free college? Wouldn't that have a more profound impact? Well, yeah, it would. But that's not what Frederick Douglass would want, apparently, if we're to believe Pete, who is now the official mouthpiece and official interpreter of Frederick Douglass's will. So, the Frederick Douglass plan that Pete Buttigieg came up with, which is literally just copy-pasting other stuff from other policies and pretending that this is all about helping the black community. How does he market this? In the most sleazy, underhanded way you can possibly imagine. Pete understands that without black support, he has no shot at the nomination. So, how does he want to win it? By subterfuge. Because he, Pete Buttigieg, is a very intelligent, very educated man, and he's made his living by taking advantage of dumb people. He assumes black voters are dumb, so he's going to try to hoodwink them. To win black support, Buttigieg resorted to sending out an email to black activists in South Carolina about his Douglas plan, saying that he would assume that he had their endorsement unless they contacted him to reject the plan by the end of the day. That is extraordinarily, extraordinarily immoral. It's unethical. It's unreasonable. Who the fuck does that? There's never been a deadline for responding to an email at the end of the day unless it's like a special offer. Hey, if you come in by the end of the day, you'll get $10 off the new Call of Duty. Only today at GameStop. If you don't miss, don't make the deadline, there's no penalty. I mean, you just don't get the money off of a game you might not actually want. So that's the only way that that is an acceptable practice. The thing is, this is using someone's name and assuming their endorsement without permission. And by setting this bullshit condition, he created a way out for himself to make it out as if he had a legal right to use these people's names. This is the most slimy, smarmy, underhanded bullshit I've seen in a campaign in a long time. This is Nixon levels of sly and underhanded. This should be disqualifying in of itself. But it isn't. And you know why? The media loves Buttigieg. This isn't being reported on. And if it is, they're laughing it off like, oh, well, he just misunderstood. Um... No, th this, is, this shows you the kind of person Pete Buttigieg is. He's a holier-than-thou, smarter-than-you guy who doesn't respect other people on any level and is willing to use and abuse them. If pundits on TV know about this and they have any ethical standards whatsoever, they should demand that Pete Buttigieg exit the race. If I were a black activist or a black pundit, I would go on TV and every time I spoke, no matter what I was asked about, I would say, and also, 
Pete Buttigieg needs to drop out. He is immoral. And he tried to cheat our community out of our vote. So for any of you out there who want to be uh, black pundits and you get invited on TV, here's your way to make it famous. And when you make it famous and get the big paycheck, remember your friend Thersites the Historian. You can support me on Patreon with your millions and millions of dollars from TV. You're welcome. Pete seemed to be enjoying a false surge just a few weeks ago. Currently, Bernie is surging. And I call it a false surge because he received a couple of favorable polls that showed him in the lead in both Iowa and New Hampshire. Those polls had a few methodological flaws like small sample size, but the mainstream press ran those polls and said that Pete is surging and that the time is now for the mayor of South Bend. Subsequent polls then came out and showed that the surge was short-lived and that he might not have actually taken first in either state at any point. And it seems like the surge is over. Pete's not eliminated and he didn't surge enough or for long enough that his fall will necessarily lead to him losing the race as a whole, but clearly his strength has been overplayed and this is yet another example of how the media loves Buttigieg and wants desperately for him to be the nominee. Currently he's stuck in the high single digits and he's in the top three in the first two states, but he's not really strong anywhere unless the state has demographics that resemble Wonder Bread i.e. you have a lot of older white people. If the state has any kind of population that's young or not white, then Pete has no chance. He has a 0% chance of winning in Nevada and South Carolina. And I doubt he'll take away any delegates from either state. Maybe he gets like one from Nevada if he manages to win both Iowa and New Hampshire and has a momentum. But Buttigieg is someone who really has very limited surge potential because of how narrow his appeal actually is. So anytime you hear a narrative about how he's surging, be very cautious and look at the margin of error on the poll, because I guarantee you any poll that says that he's really killing it is probably one that has some built-in flaws. To put it simply, Pete Buttigieg has almost no chance of winning outright in the Democratic primary. His most plausible path to victory is through a brokered convention, where Tom Steyer, Michael Bloomberg, and the other Obviously, fake candidates give their delegates to Pete at the end on the second ballot. If he somehow manages to win on the first ballot, however, we can actually discuss him in a general election. Now, I have no doubt that if it goes to a brokered convention, the establishment will make sure that someone like Pete is their nominee. If he is produced by a brokered convention, the only chance he has of beating Trump is if the country falls into a great recession. Otherwise, he is guaranteed to lose. However, if he wins outright, it's a more interesting question. So let's say he somehow manages to win enough delegates to win on the first ballot, and there's no accusations of voter fraud or anything like that. Pete just managed to eke it out due to the dynamics of the field. Here's a problem. He still will have trouble getting young voters and voters of color. Sure, he'll outperform Trump in those arenas because he's a Democrat, but he's not going to win enough to win swing states. It's just not going to happen. If we look at the Midwest, where Pete is supposedly strong because he's from there, he has an economic message that is geared toward rural white people. Now, you might think that is something that Democrats have been sore lacking in recent years, and you're right, but you have to remember there are two elements to winning the Midwest. One is turning out, uh, say, the white working class, especially in places like Akron or... Um, Dearborn, Michigan, places like that, you have to win some of those voters. So you have to win a certain percentage of white people who would otherwise vote Republican for cultural issues. You have to give them something to vote for economically. That's why Sherrod Brown wins in Ohio and all other Democrats here can't win for shit because they won't talk about unions or economics. So that's part of it. There's another part that Democrats typically do well on that Pete doesn't understand and tends to overlook. And that is that you need to win black people who live in the major cities. If you can't turn out the vote in Cleveland, Milwaukee, Detroit, Flint, and places like that, you can't win. That's what cost Hillary Michigan and Wisconsin, by the way. I mean, sure, she could have made up the votes in other ways, but that was two-thirds of the reason why she ended up losing in the end. Pennsylvania is the place where she really needed to get white voters out more. But anyway, um, I can't see him doing any better than she did on the map 
unless he fundamentally changes who he is and what he stands for. Right now, his current message, which is ironic and absurd in the extreme, is that he opposes Washington elitism and he stands for middle America. Pete Buttigieg is a five-time Washington consultant. He's worked at least five times for different consulting firms. Maybe it's four, I don't remember. Four or five. And he thinks that he's going to be able to walk onto a stage, look people straight in the eye, and say, I represent middle America. I'm not some sort of elitist from Washington. I'm, an, I'm a Rhodes Scholar. I, what the fuck is he thinking? This is absurd. Um, he, he has other messages. Originally he tried to run as the representative of the Christian left. He wanted to win over evangelicals on the left. That was his grand strategy. And he dropped that just like he dropped the universal service thing because it doesn't work. If he's trying to appeal to evangelical Christians, a lot of them vote Republican, and the ones who vote Democrat anyway would vote for someone who actually has some sort of moral decency, not someone who talks about, yeah, I'm a Christian and I'm proud of it. So, yeah, he, he's got no message, he's got no strategy, he has no chance. So, you might think, well, at least he's smarter than Trump, and he's definitely a lot slyer. Surely he'd beat him in the debate and gain something from that. He is, after all, a pretty decent debater. Here's the problem. Pete would actually do worse than almost anyone else in a debate with Trump, and the reason is because he's thin-skinned and temperamental. When he was in his little exchange with Tulsi in the last debate, Pete was on the verge of coming unglued. The man was fucking furious that Tulsi would dare challenge him on his stances on regime change wars. And he was angry that she would reject his um, rejection of her label of regime change war. He also got furious that she called out the fact that he said that he'd be willing to deploy troops to Mexico. He felt like he was being treated unfairly because that's the first time on TV that anyone has ever said anything negative to him. And he can't stand it. He won't abide by it. He's thin-skinned. Trump would eat this motherfucker alive. Trump is a high school bully in his 70s. Trump would just insult Pete Buttigieg for looking like a chipmunk or being lame or for his low black supporter, whatever, and Pete would respond in kind. He'd come off as petty and small. He would just say, well, you met with Kim Jong-un. Eh. It would be terrible. It would be awful. He would, he would look like a little bitch. It, no one would want to vote for that. He would definitely win in the technical sense in the debates, but he wouldn't win any votes. That's been his problem all along. He doesn't convince anyone that he's trustworthy of their votes. He can only win in a purely academic sense. Pete Buttigieg, fundamentally, as I've mentioned before in my debate coverage, is someone who seems like he learned everything that he knows about public speaking and political behavior from Aaron Sorkin's West Wing. Pete Buttigieg lives in a fantasy world. This guy is unelectable. He's out of touch with reality. Despite being a self-proclaimed expert in politics, Pete Buttigieg knows nothing. And this man can't win. He has no appeal. He sucks. He's someone who knew the right people and checked the right boxes so that he could pretend to be important and be in the room. And now he's in the room. The people there like him because he's a useful idiot who was willing to carry water for corporate America. But that doesn't mean he can get elected. This guy is clueless. He's a fucking joke. And now, after ranting about Mayor Pete for longer than I ever thought possible, let's conclude this rant of a video. There's a recent article called Pete Buttigieg the Lying MFR, which I think is one of the best articles written in recent times. There's a famous quote from that article which I think summarizes Pete Buttigieg in a nutshell. Pete Buttigieg doesn't stand for anything. He just wants to be something. There you go. I could have summarized this video in 10 seconds by just quoting the gentleman who wrote that article and then moved on with my life, which in retrospect is exactly what I should have done, but I've already run my mouth for over an hour, so we're just going to go with this bullshit instead. Pete's candidacy is just as redundant and pointless as the candidacies of Messam, Delaney, and the two billionaires who don't deserve to be named yet again. There's no reason for him to be in this race. He stands for nothing. He has no vision. He offers us nothing. He can't beat Trump. 
He won't bring about fundamental change. He will not make America better in any discernible way. Without his initial propping up by CNN and his continued support from them, there is absolutely no way that Pete would still have the funds and the name recognition to be in this race. If CNN hadn't decided to make him the fourth member of the Godhead, he would have dropped out months ago. And I wouldn't even be making a video about him right now because I've already would have made a very short video talking about how he had run before his time. But I don't think he'll ever have a time. I have no doubt that he'll continue to run and continue to try to promote himself. But Pete Buttigieg inherently is not the kind of person who can get elected. He doesn't have it. There's an it factor. He ain't got it. He's someone who was on course to be a Karl Rove figure, except dumber. And that's probably where he'll go back to. Pete, stop running for office. You suck. You're clearly incapable of governing. You can't run a city. Now you think you're going to run a country. It's not going to happen, buddy. You suck. That is not your calling in life. You're still young. Get out of the politics game and do something else, because that is not you. You are literally incapable of exercising leadership on any level. I feel bad for anyone who had to take orders from your sorry ass in Afghanistan because you are fundamentally unfit to make decisions. You have no ability to strategize or follow through. Frankly, sir, you have no balls. Until your balls drop, you should consider doing something else. Go write novels about being a gay mayor or some shit. Just don't bother us by trying to run for office when you're clearly unqualified, you're incapable of winning, and you have no leadership qualities or vision whatsoever. Go fuck yourself, Pete.